you about it's about Idaho based climate change. And we're going to talk, we kind of broke this up into a couple different sections here. And our goal is to both talk to you guys about climate change and what that means for Idaho and give you guys some ideas of labs or experiments or discussions or ways to phrase this that you can then take back to your students to bring climate change home so that you can relate it to what they see every day and their everyday lives to make it more real because everything matters more when it's actually happening in your life and you're not just looking at pictures of far away places because those are very nice, but let's take it, let's take it home first. So the basics here, climate is changing. I don't think anybody's gonna argue with that. Um, but what does it mean for us here? <laughs> you're what, you're oh, I know, 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 I made statements for things that I thought were kind of general truths, and they're like, oh boy, okay. I think where a lot of people differentiate, we all agree climate is changing, what we're not agreeing on is why it happens. Okay. So what, what, the, what causes it? I mean, some of it we know is natural because over the time, climate has always changed. But how much of it do we impact that big way? Great, that is a really good point. Um, Carrie and I are, uh, we're going camping with you guys this evening, and I would love to talk about that, but I could easily take over our entire lecture here. So come find me later this afternoon <laughs> if you want to have that discussion and figure out, you know, what the, what the past is, what the past has been, um, what, what we know now and how things are changing, and ways that we might be able to talk about that with students. Because I'd love to have that discussion. But right now, it's probably not the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to give you that yeah. not everybody believes, it's not that we don't believe it's not changing. It's just okay. all a matter of, yeah. Got it. All right. So regardless of the causes, climate has changed. And here in, in the Boise area, the question is, how is climate change, as it, as it continues, as it keeps happening, how is that going to matter here? And what we've focused on this morning so far is a lot about water. You guys are going to be doing a lot of water quality investigations. So I'm going to start by focusing us on water and what that means for places and people here in Treasure Valley. So you guys have seen a few of these maps. Um, in kind of a different permutation, but here we have, this is like a super fancy thing, we have the, the upper basin and then the lower basin here. And so these two different maps, well they're maps of the same place and they've got different data imposed on them. So this top map shows temperatures, their average annual mean temperatures in this area, and really the take home message here is blue is cold, red is hot, you'll note there is no blue, um, yellow is kind of in between, so up here in the upper basin we've got some colder average annual temperatures, and down here in the lower basin it's hot. I don't think this is, this is probably not news to anybody. Um, similarly, in this bottom map here, it's the same, the same area, and the data that's shown on this map is annual precipitation. Again, here, this is kind of backwards because compared to that one, because in this one, blue is more precipitation and red is less precipitation. So you can see that in the, the Boise River Basin, most of the precipitation comes in the upper basin and there's not as much in the lower basin. Okay, so basic information. What does that mean? Huh? Huh? Didn't look like that earlier. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might change, like when I converted it to PowerPoint, there might be some uh, slight sure adjustments made. Yeah, with a little bit of, Yeah, a little, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> little bit of change and whatever will survive. So what does that mean for water availability in Boise? And this is where I'm going to ask you guys. So what, based on these two maps and the little bit that I've talked about here, what does that mean for water in Boise? Where does it come from? What time? How much? What do you guys? What do you guys know? What do you put together? Yeah. Snow. Snow. That's a key point. Yes. Well, there's a, a lot of input in the upper part and a lot of output, or it's you know for using it for agriculture in the lower part. Yeah. Yes. I think a big part of it is timing. That's the one that all comes off. What do you mean by timing? So if you have average higher average temperatures in the upper basin, that's going to melt that snow a lot quicker and therefore bring it off a lot earlier in the spring. Great. You guys are faster 
after connecting the dots to the fifth and sixth graders. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were saying that. Really. <laughs> Lucky Peak, I've been seeing it going down for like ever, and these big old gaps, and then they put all the, they were running so much water up. And I'm like, why don't they just back it into there? You know, common person to say, why don't they just back it into there? And then um, I was reading an article about uh, how the engineers and everybody determined that we've got to get this water down the road because there's more coming and that will back that up into there. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a, lot, a lot of people not understanding Whenever why they're letting so much water go through, and then how do they? What if not as much water comes afterwards, and they don't fill that up, and then people are really ticked off because you flooded us, <laughs> and now you're telling us we don't have enough water, and we have to you know wash our cars once a month. Type yeah. thing. So I mean, how do they? I mean the. The, an analogy for that, I'm, I'm big in analogies. I teach undergrad students, and then at Moss, I've taught fifth and sixth graders, and I, I like analogies. I use a lot of them. Uh, a good way to think about that is you can imagine um, like a, a faucet, right? So you have a faucet here, and you can, you can determine how much you open and how much you close the faucet. What's coming into the faucet is an icicle, and you can't control what's melting and how fast it's melting. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's going fast, maybe it's going slow, you can do your best to try to mitigate it, but you can't control all of it. So you have to make some guesses. So what we have here is I just, I went on to the USGS website and I was looking for data on the Boise River. This is a hydrograph at the Glenwood Bridge. I'll be honest, I don't know Boise. I don't actually know where that is. It's <coughs> like a mile from here. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Very close. Um, so here we've got a hydrograph that shows um, a water year, and water years start in October and go through the next October. So it's not a calendar year, you know, fiscal years are different, calendar years are different, water years are different as well. And the blue line is daily mean discharge. And just in case anyone isn't quite up on what I mean by that, is that means if, uh, if this table is the river and it's flowing that way, if I draw a, a plane straight through this river here, what is the volume of water that is passing through that plane? If you're a boater, you'll hear about this in CFS, cubic feet per second, so how many cubic feet of water are passing through this plane every second? Here, they've, they've moved it out to per day. So instead of cubic feet per second, it would be cubic feet per day. Well, they plotted it in cubic feet per second, but they're looking at averages over the course of the day. So it's just how much water is actually flowing through this plane cut through in the river. So, and this is a, a log scale on the y-axis. So higher values are a lot more, and lower values, you know, the lower part of the line is less. So what we see is starting in October and going through the winter, this is low, this is low flow, the water is down low. And then right here in April, shoom, it goes way up. What happens in April? Spring melts, and you guys nailed it earlier when we were talking about this, that in Idaho, what matters a lot is snow. Snow determines water availability later, because something we drive home to the students we teach in Moss is that winter is a drought. Winter is a drought because there's a ton of snow, and that snow is made up of water, but it's not immediately available. So it's harder for animals to survive then, not just from temperature, but for water availability. But related to what you were talking about, with when we have water and when we need it, it, it matters how, how much snow is there and when that's going to show up. So what I'm gonna talk about next is I'm gonna walk you guys through a lab experiment that's a, a hands-on experiment that we do with students at Moss to really kind of both bring this point home, snow melts and spring melts and how that matters for water availability, but then it also brings in another layer, which is it brings in the question of what happens as climate changes. So just to get some basic ideas, what do you guys think is gonna happen to this sort of hydrograph in the next 50 years, in the next 100 years, to this place, to the Boise River right here, a mile upstream? What's gonna happen? Yes? So let me let me check my laser pointer 
damage deals here. So you're saying that we're kind of going to go low, and then at, at an earlier point, instead of rocketing straight up, it's maybe going to be more curved? Yeah? Anybody agree? Disagree? No. All right. Class poll. Do you agree with, with that, that guess? Do you disagree with that guess? You really don't know. So there's a few kind of materials that you need to put this together. And the most important thing to make this work is you must have snow. <laughs> you have to be able to send kids outside to get some buckets of snow. Without that, it's not going to work so well. Hey, Mark. Yes. We faked it two weeks ago, though, and bought Sonic. Kind of a picture of the setup, and they're actually going to go get the pieces to put it together. So what you end up doing when you build it is you take your tray, this is a, a metal oven, you know, like a, you get a lasagna on a dish, uh, mm -hmm. and you put a plastic, or a metal lid over the top, anything like that would work fine. So you take that and you kind of bend it a little bit so it goes into a funnel. So you imagine if you poured water on top of this, you'd want it to run into the funnel and then go into this container. And you need a scale of some sort because you need to know, you need to be able to weigh how much water you end up with and weigh the amounts of snow that you're going to use. And then the last thing <coughs> is you need a heat lamp because that's going to be the sun. So we set it up like this and when, when we come back with the actual example, we'll put it up here and that will make even more sense than this picture. What? No, we're not actually going to do the experiment. Um, <laughs> sorry. So here, so if you do this with, with students in a class, you'd set this up beforehand, because you don't really want to spend tons of the actual experiment time with your students trying to figure out how to arrange a funnel and where to put the buckets. No, you want to work, work that out the, the day before. So then to start, you probably want to talk with the students and frame things in the same way that I tried to introduce this idea to you now. Where does water in Idaho come from? When does it show up? Maybe look at the a hydrograph of a river that's nearby. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Cool. Um, look at some. Look at a, a hydrograph of a nearby river. Something to bring it home to show this is what happens now. You can talk about who uses that water, where that water comes from. That goes back to watersheds. Oops, I think that's the wrong button. Watersheds, which we talked about this morning. So form a hypothesis for once you guys know the experiment, which we'll get into real soon. What, what the students think is going to happen, and then what they think might happen later on. So here is the procedure for the experiment, and I'm going to skip through this slide because I'm going to talk about it on the next slide, but it's here, and you can check this for further reference if you want to see it later. So you get that set up. Remember, here we go. As a cross section, we had our tray, which went into a funnel, a funnel, and then it went into a bucket, and here we have this up. You how I was really close to majoring in art. So we've got this set up in two different experiments, and you could do it in a class, and you could do it. You could have um, everybody do test number one, and then everybody do test number two. What we usually did at Moss is we broke them up into groups and we had maybe four groups total. And we had two groups do test number one and two groups do test number two. So you can kind of get them both going at the same time. And then we would come back as a group and discuss the data. So we start at the beginning of the water year. We start in October. And so test number one is the current climate precipitation pattern. Test number two is with climate change. So in October, you take 50 grams of snow zero grams of rain, so for a total of 50 grams. So this is where you need to take your snow or your shaved ice and measure out 50 grams. 
And on your on your metal tray, yeah, metal tray here, this is where the, the funnel would go. You just pile it up, don't make it into a mound, kind of spread it out over the whole area. It works better if you spread it out. Um, so we've got see, we're gonna have purple snow. Purple snow up here. So you put the snow on, you set your timer for 30 minutes. 30 minutes, that's a lie. Three minutes. You set your timer for three minutes. And in that time, this is just average room temperature. The heat lamp is off because the heat lamp is the sun. The sun gets turned on in March. The sun is off for the winter. It's <laughs> on for the spring and summer. Um, so you leave the heat lamp off and you wait three minutes. And while those three minutes are going, you can send your students out to get more snow, to lay out more snow. So that at the end of three minutes, they are totally ready to move on to November. Because October's three minutes long, November's three minutes long, December's three minutes long. Um, and so at the end of three minutes, at the end of October, they take the bucket that's underneath the funnel here. We found that plastic yogurt containers work very well. They're kind of good sizes. So you take the one that would have any melt from October, swap in the next one for November, and while that's happening, students can put more snow on here, and then other people in the group can take whatever the October melt was, weigh it on the scale, see how much melt. And the process continues month by month by month. So we get October with 50 grams, November it snows a little more, December it snows a little more, January, February, March. March you turn the sun on. Plug in the sun, plug in your heat lamp. Before I got a question here. Yes. So um, in November you got 90 grams, October you got 50 grams. My question is, are you just adding the difference between the 50 and the 90 or are you putting another 90? Fantastic question. You are putting a whole nother 90. Each month is brand new, and this is how much precipitation is received in that month. Yes? Is the CC equivalent to one gram? Yes. Yes. Why did you go CC? What? Why did you go CC? Um, because when you use, so lots of the CCs are looking, it's, it's better for the rain because the rain is actually water. We'll get there in just a second. But the way to do that is if you have a graduated cylinder, those are marked in CCs. It's the same thing. Um, any other questions at the moment? Okay. So we go through, and each month, um, students will weigh the amount, and um, you can put it in a, in a spreadsheet or a graph or a chart. Uh, and then, so March is where it gets different. March is where the sun turns on. And then in April, instead of having snow, you have rain. And so each month, you're probably not going to melt the total amount of snow. In fact, if you, if you do melt the, whole, the total amount of snow, your experiment's a little wonky and you might want to investigate that. But that's not, not quite what happens. Yes? So do you use a spray bottle to squirt the rain on to the snow? Um, that could work. I think that might add more time onto the experiment than usual. So what, what we've done is we just had, you know, we weighed out the amount of rain, the 70 cc's or 70 grams, and we just kind of poured it on top of the snow. Spray bottle might be a little more accurate, but this but was poking kind of... holes, poking holes in the bottom of the buckets that come out of maybe, so that it come out more like rain. Sure, you make a little sprinkler thing. Yeah. Sprinkler. Sure, that could work. Um, so that's the, that's the current climate change. And then the difference here with the climate change scenario is you get rain and snow in the same months. You keep everything the same, you add up everything the same way, March is when the sun turns on, but for example, for February, <coughs> instead of adding 90 grams of snow, like this group does, this group would add 50 grams of snow and 40 cc's of rain. Because the, the argument being, climate is changing, it's getting warmer, and so we're not getting just snow, we're getting snow and rain. So you can have your students make hypotheses in the middle um, to figure out like what's the difference, what is the difference going to be, and then they can graph the results. Yes. So do you usually have these tests running simultaneously? Like once we group? we did so we had it all at the same. Um, so we had just different groups of students doing different ones, and what I had them do was put all of their data on a whiteboard, and then we put a graph, and so they could graph them and compare. Them. So it's, here's some pictures from what we did at Moss. This, these were our setups. We had data. 
I found it worked very well to put the two graphs, the two curves on the same graph, like on the same set of x, y axes on the front of the, on a board in the front of the class. And then you can talk with the students about what we see and what this means for everybody. And so why this change in water delivery matters. You know, who cares if water comes earlier, if we don't get the peak in April, but instead we get, you know, a more broad, spread out curve that maybe starts in January. What is that gonna mean for all the people downstream? So we would talk about farming, ranching, recreation, hydropower, land usage. All of these are good ways that you can bring this example home so that it matters to students here. That's the end of my first section.